the way this is going to work, uh, we'll be talking the, the next three days on the, the Paul's letter to the Philippians. All right, we're going to look at the book of Philippians. As RJ said, it's a very short book. It's four chapters long. So what's going to happen is basically this. Uh, in our first section, we're going to lay a foundation. We're going to look at Bible study and how Bible study is important. And what are things to consider when you're Bible so when you're when you're studying the Bible? If you're taking classes, if you have taken classes with us, you will recognize a lot of this material. If you have not taken classes with us, these are things to consider when you do study the Bible, whatever wave or form, whether it be uh, studying it by book or studying it by a topic. Now, these are always things to consider when you're studying the Bible. Uh, so this is our first part. After we get done with this, we're going to have a break, and we'll have some snacks, and then we're going to go into the second part, which is we're going to talk about the background of the book itself. Who was the writer? Uh, who are the readers? What kind of what, what, what was the church like in, that, in, the, in the city of Philippi? What was Philippi? How did it start? These kinds of things. These are the things that we're going to look at tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to get into the book of Philippians. We're going to, we're going to, since it's only four chapters, the rest of the time is going to be broken up one chapter each section. Okay? And there's a lot of background stuff that I'm going to pull in into the discussion as well, because some interesting things that, that I've learned over the past uh, few months and studying with this, no? Okay, so each section, uh, so tomorrow we're going to look at chapters one and two, and then three and four will be the, the following day, the third day. And at the end of the third day, we'll have a summary for the, the entire book and look and see what was what was the goal that Paul was trying to get to these readers and see how does this apply to us today. Okay, And then we're going to have questions. And we'll have an open forum where you can ask questions regarding the, the lesson that we've talked about, all, this, all the stuff that we've talked about here. So I would encourage you guys to hold questions until that time. If you have any questions, write them on your notes, you know, on, on the, the papers or whatever. And uh, when we get to that, we'll, uh, we'll answer some questions. If we have time at the end of our, our time tonight, then uh, I, could, I can uh, address some questions then as well. But it just depends on if time permits. No? So, without further ado, I guess we'll get started. All right. There we go. As most of you know, religion today, there are a lot of religious groups who claim to be Christians, right? In fact, there are over 38,000 different religious, group, religious groups who claim to be Christians. Now, like I said, if you've taken our classes at the Bible Study Center before, especially Jesus, Man, and the Bible, a lot of this material is going to be uh, covered again. Okay? Uh, each one of these groups, these 38,000 groups, claims to be following Christ. They all claim to be following the Bible, and they all claim to be Christians. But the interesting thing that we have to consider is this. No two group teaches the same thing. You look at these 38,000 different religious groups, you see everybody has their own understanding about what the Bible says. Now, is this good? Is this right? Is this how it's supposed to be? Is this what Jesus died for? If you look in the original, you know, the, the first century, how many groups were there? There's only one. So why is it now there are 38,000 different religious groups? Well, the problem is this. Let's all look at, uh, we've given you some Bibles. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I'll, I'll grab you a Bible, and uh, we can get you some. Anybody need a Bible? Anybody else? Did you want? Class? Does The thing that we see in religion today is people tend to add things, take away things. You know, they pick and choose what they are going to be talk, uh, what they're going to be teaching in their religious groups. 
The question is, is this is this right? Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. Would somebody like to read? All scripture is God breath and useful for, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right. The Bible message comes from God. All right. If you look at the if you look at the Bible in its in its entirety, you see that there are 66 books which were written in about 100 uh, 1,500 years, right? Over a course of 1,500 years, by over 40 different writers. And yet the thing is, is, this message is actually from God and not from these men. There are passages that talk about this. There are passages that say that you know this is not from God. We're going to look at some of them. Okay. The, the message is from God and is, is for a purpose, right? It's useful for something. It's useful for what? For reproof, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work, right? So, yeah. Useful for teaching, for training, for correcting. With it, we have everything we need to do any good work. Because it comes from God and not from man, the Bible message is useful and complete. Okay. Now, if you look at the religious world today, like I said, they tend to, to pick and choose the things that they wish to teach, right? The, the thing that we have to remember is that the most important thing when considering, uh, when, when studying the Bible is putting things into their proper context. Alright? And when you put something into its proper context, uh, you can see the idea that the writer is trying to make, uh, the, the, the point that the writer is trying to make, right? If, if say for example, you receive a letter from your, your parents, you know, saying, you know, uh, your father just died. It's the only thing that you read of that whole letter. Your father just died. What you're thinking in your mind is your father is now dead. So you're going to go to their place, and you're going to go there because, you know, you're going to comfort your mother because your father's dead, and you have to arrange for funeral things and stuff, you know, all of these preparations and whatnot. So all this time you're going there, and uh, when you arrive, who answers the door? Your father. So you're wondering. What's going on? So, the explanation is given that if you would have read the letter in its entirety, in its context, you would have seen that there was a party and there was a joke that was made and your father died laughing. Putting things into their proper context is important when studying the Bible, just like it's important with everyday life. When we read letters from people, we have to put things into their proper context to understand what the writer intended to say to the readers. Diba? Otherwise, you can make up anything you want just by picking a section. This is the problem. This is what the religious world is doing. We as Bible students need to apply these these things, putting things into proper context and things like this, in order to get rid of that problem. If people would read things into their proper context, they would see that there is only one message. Because when a writer writes something, it is for a purpose. And if you don't read the verses before, the verses after it, to find out what that purpose is, then you can just make up anything you want as you go. Diba? And that's not proper Bible study. So, just like I said, you know, Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen, there is a purpose behind the Bible. It is a message from God, and it is useful for things. It is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting people in their, you know, in their understandings, and for training people in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 is another passage that we would like to read. Uh, would somebody else like to read that?
Anybody? Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but merely spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay. In this particular passage, we see that the men are giving a message, right? But where does this message come from? Okay. We must understand this, that no interpretation, uh, no, no, uh, still scripture is from one's own interpretation, but man moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay. Here we have uh, two words that we need to talk about, interpreting and understanding. What does it mean to interpret something? Okay. Based on your opinion or your own understanding about something, right? What is understanding? It's the opposite of interpreting, right? It's fact. What's one plus one? Why is it two? Why is it not three or four? <laughs> because someone, somewhere, who had the authority said that one plus one equals two. And therefore, everybody accepts the fact that one plus one is two and not eleven or, you know, some other number like this, right? So, the writers did not write their own ideas in these teachings. This is why it is possible for 1,500 years of time to pass, and yet there are no contradictions whatsoever among the 40-plus different writers. How, did, how was this possible? It's very simple. God sent the Holy Spirit to guide them what to say. It's like this. Who wrote this? Who wrote what is on the board? Did I write did I write it? Can I write anything on the board? No, I can't. I can't physically write things on the board. The pen was the one who did this. The pen is the one who wrote it. But where did the message come from? From me, right? In the same way, God used these men as instruments, just like I used the pen to write down what I wanted to say. Did the pen uh, write the? Me uh, did the pen come up with the message? No, the message came from me, right? In the same way, God used these men. See, God used these men to write message, and the outcome was what we have today, our Bibles. It's that simple. And that's what this, this passage is talking about. How did God do this? He did it by means of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the one who guided these men. God told the Holy Spirit what to, what to, do, what to say, and these men said it, or wrote it. And this is how we come up with, uh, this is how we received our Bible as we have it today. So it's through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because the Bible comes from God, we must respect that it comes from Him, and we have no right to change it. Diva? Since it's His message, the only person that has the right to change the message is the one who gives the message. Diva? So, people today have no right to change it. We can't sit there and try to interpret what it says. We have to seek to understand what it says. Diva. This is proper Bible study. So, it is our job to follow exactly what he says. The way he says it. And not try to come up with our own interpretation of it. Diva. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 to 15.
do you like it when people change what you say? Like, say, I'm, say I, uh, say you ask somebody to go and tell somebody else. Like, uh, you know, say you have uh, your your son or daughter, and you ask them to go tell your neighbor uh, this uh, a certain thing. But when it comes time, uh, they arrive there at the place. They tell them something different. They change the message to mine. How do you feel when that happens? How do you feel? Uh, how do you feel when when people misrepresent you? Sakit, disappointed, di ba? Well, how does God feel? What does this passage say? Second Timothy two fourteen to fifteen. Remind your people of this, and give them solemn warning in God's presence not to fight over words. It does not, it does no good, but only ruins the people who reach on the plane. Do your best to win full approval in God's sight as a worker who is not ashamed of his work, one who correctly teaches the message of God's truth. The situation here in this passage is that the people that they were writing, that Paul was writing to, were arguing over meanings of words, trying to to make things mean something that they didn't, or or things like this, and they were missing the point of the letter of the the message that was given. This is the second letter to Timothy, because apparently there was something. In the first letter that people were confused about and they were trying to make it say something or this or that and they were causing problems. So to, to alleviate that problem, he tells them this. He says, we must, you know, we must handle God's message correctly. It's his message and we have no right to change it. We have no right to change it. We can't add anything. We can't take away anything. It has to be all or nothing. Because it's his message. The same teachings for all people in all places in all times. So, the meaning of the message, or the message that they received, is the same message that we have today. It's not different. So why is it there are 38,000 different groups? I don't know. We have some warnings also. The Apostle Paul in some of his letters wrote warnings. And not just the Apostle Paul, but you know, James and John and a few other people, a few of the other writers. By the end of the first century, we find that even though Jesus, when Jesus died, he said that the message was not complete and that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. Now, that's in John. Uh, by the end of the first century, we already see warnings written to the, the Christians of the, uh, the, the different places, telling them, don't go beyond what was told to you. Don't add anything, because it's already complete. No? For example, in Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatian church, chapter 1, verse 3 to 9, at the very beginning of his letter, he says, what does he say? Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. Okay, how would you like to get a letter from the Apostle Paul starting out like that? After he gets done with the normal greeting of, you know, <coughs> grace and peace to you and things like this, the first thing he says, I am astonished. 
that you are so quickly turning away from, you know, what it, what they what they know is right. Diba? There's this other gospel, which isn't really a gospel at all. No? No? Obviously, it was a big problem in this church for him to actually put that first. No? He even says, if even we or an angel from heaven comes to you with a different message, something that is different from what we told you in the past, let him be condemned or accursed. No? Apparently, by the end of the first century, there was no more new message. It was already completely given. And then these people were who were, who were coming up with these new messages, these new ideas and things like this, that were not actually part of the new agreement. Uh, this, 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 uh, this message that Christ was giving. No? Where did it come from? Iba. Second John, chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. There's only one chapter in this, so it's just verse 9 to 11. This is the second letter written by, uh, well, this is actually the third letter written by John, but it's the, the second little letter. What does is, what is 2 John verse 9 to 11 say? Anyone who does not stay with the teaching of Christ but goes beyond it, does not have God. Whoever does stay with the teaching has not the Father and the Son. So, so then, if some come to you who do not bring this teaching, do not welcome them in your homes. Do not even say, peace be with you. For anyone who wishes them peace becomes their partner they do. Wow. It's interesting. If someone comes to you with something different that was not in the original stuff, don't have anything to do with them. Basically is what he says. If you do, if you even greet them, hello, or, you know, peace be with you. May it be well with you. What's going to happen? You become a partner with him. Even though you're not teaching those things, even though you're not believing those things, you become a partner with that person. Wow. It's kind of harsh, don't you think? <coughs> but hey, that's how serious God is about his message. It's his message and no one has the right to change it that's the point that these guys are trying to get to these these readers to understand and those people who are coming up with these these new teachings these false teachers as as the the different books will will call them you know it he's trying to get these people to stop and go back go back to what they knew from the beginning when they first became christians you know? Revelations 22, verse 18 to 19 is another place where it talks about this. I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone has anything to them, God will add to him describing this book. And if anyone takes away words, from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in all the city which are described. Mm -hmm. Anyone who adds or takes away from this book or any other book, for that matter, because this book, more or less the same stuff. What happens to them? Adds or takes away? Bad things happen. <laughs> Bad things happen. So we have to be very careful when we study the Bible. Studying the Bible is an important endeavor. 
And every time we study the Bible, we need to remember all the time that this is not a message that was from men. This is a message that was from God. And he, has the, he is the only person who has the right to change it. We cannot make it say something that it doesn't. We have to seek to understand what exactly it is that the writers were trying to get the people to understand. And this is what we're going to do with the book of Philippians. Okay, We're going to look at the Philippian letter, and then we'll make some conclusions at the end and see what is it that the Paul, Apostle Paul was trying to get readers to understand, get the readers to do or change or things like this. Okay, and So we're going to apply these things when it comes to you know our uh, going through the book itself. People were already changing the truth. By the, by the end of the first century, it wasn't even, you know, 100 years after Christ died. It wasn't, it was probably, you know, not even 50 years after Christ died that things were starting to change. It wasn't until a little later that they started to, to write letters saying, hey, don't change it, don't change it, go back, go back. You know? A lot of the letters that were written uh, by, by Paul, especially the, like the one that we're gonna read, it's estimated that it was written about 67, 68 A.D. Uh, yeah, A.D. That's about 35, 40 years, maybe, give or take, uh, after Christ died. So it's not long at all. Already there were changes. There were teachings that were not supposed to be there. No? Now, 2,000, 3,000 you know, 2,000 years later, not 3,000, but 2,000 years later, you know, we have 38,000 groups who say they're Christians, who say they're they're following the Bible, who say they follow Christ, and the Christ is their Lord, and yet no two group teaches the same thing. Something is very wrong. Niba. And the only way we can fix it is to learn how to study the Bible correctly. Learn how to study the Bible in its context. So everyone was warned not to accept any changes. And that if they did, bad things would happen to them. The context is important. It's our obligation to understand that uh, what the message is as it was intended. Right? Because it's God's message to us. Therefore, we need to know what God wants us to do, not what men think God wants us to do. Because how would you like it if, if you want someone to do something, but then the person you tell <laughs> changes some things, and then this person does it differently? Are you going to be happy with that? No. Because you want it done a specific way. Say you're building a house and you have a foreman, right? The foreman is the one who's in charge of making sure that uh, all the workers are doing things the way they're supposed to be doing. And you tell the foreman, this is what I want done with this. I want it to be X amount of, of uh, feet by so, so much feet and, and, and these kinds of things. You know, I want the, the second floor of the house to have, you know, four windows. And a balcony, and I want the roof to be painted blue. Right? But the foreman, <coughs> the foreman, uh, relays the message, only he changes it. Instead of blue, it's green. Are you gonna be happy with that? No, because it's not the way you wanted it done. Diva? For God, it's the same way. Because look at the warnings. Look at the warnings that he said. It's gonna be a bad thing for someone to change those things. They're going to have to pay. Diva. So it is our job to seek to understand what God wants. What God wants us to do. What God says. Diva. We can't sit there and try to make it up as we go along. Or read a little bit of it and try and fill in the gaps. We must teach in a way that preserves the intended meaning of the one who, who originated that message. Remember, all these letters that were written to these churches were not from the apostles themselves. God was the one who was speaking through these apostles. Anything less would be disrespectful. 
It would be disrespectful to God and unethical. It's not right. Because it's not our message and we have no right to change it. It's that simple. So like I said, how do you feel when you, people mis uh, misrepresent what you say? Is God so different from us in this, me in this matter? It's an interesting thought. We don't like it when we're misrepresented. We don't like it when people change what we say or distort what we say. No? Why is this so important? Why is it so important for us to make sure that what we say, what we do, what we, what we believe is exactly what God wants? Here. Look at this passage. Everybody turn to this passage and see what it says. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Noel, go ahead. Why don't you read out loud for us? Uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. He who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, and in your name still many more words? Then I will promptly say to them, I never know you. Get away from me, you ever wonder. What kind of people does Jesus talk about in this? What kind of people were they? Huh? Religious people. Okay, I guess you could say they were religious people. What else? <laughs> they're hypocrites. I was actually looking for the, the the character that these people were. What kind of what kind of people were they? Were they good people? Were they evil people? They're good people, right? They were doing good things. What were some of the things that were mentioned? Did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Well, casting out demons is a good thing, is it not? I mean, nobody wants to live with a demon inside of them. What else? Did we not? Mighty works. Some some translations say miracles. All of these done in your name. Whose name? Okay. These were, you know, people, you would say these were good people, right? Well, what kind of people did Christ say they were? They called them evil. He called them evil people. Why? There. The key here is the will of the Father. Was it done or not? They did not do the will of the Father, and therefore, what happened? He said, depart from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. It's not like I don't know you anymore, but it's I never knew you. Just because you may be a religious person, just because I may be a religious person does not mean that I'm going to get to heaven. I could go to church every single day. From the day, you know, from the day I was conscious about what I was doing to, to the, the day I die. Or I could, you know, pray all the time or, you know, do good things for people. I could uh, be a benevolent person, all these kinds of things. But according to this, the final analysis is whether or not I am doing the will of the Father. Just because I am a good person, I am a benevolent person, I am a, uh, an honest and you know, trustworthy person, does not mean I'm going to go to heaven. Just because I go to church every day, every day, every Sunday, does not mean that I'm going to get to heaven. 
It all depends on what is the will of the Father. And this is why Bible study is important. How will you know what the will of the Father is if you don't study? Can we trust our religious leaders? Why? Because what if they're wrong? Can you trust me with anything that I am saying here? No. Don't trust me. In fact, take everything that I am saying, read it for yourself, and find out if what I am saying is true. And if it is, great. If it's not, you come tell me. You come tell me so I can fix it. Because that's how it's supposed to be done. Because each and every one of us are responsible for our own salvation. I won't be able to be there on the day of judgment. Whenever it's your turn to get up and uh, you know account for the things that you've done on this earth. Your religious leader will, will not be there. Because they have to account for their own things. It's just between me and God. You and God. And that's it. So don't trust anyone when it comes to your beliefs. Don't just take for granted the religious world. Because, I mean, there are 38,000 different religious groups who are claiming to be Christians, and yet there are no two groups who are teaching the same thing. But in the, in the book of Acts, at the very beginning, there was only one group. Something terribly wrong is going on in the world today. So the question is, what is important? The will of the Father. That's why we have to seek to understand the will of the Father. Now, I've, I've really gone ahead of myself. No. So we're just going to, yeah, okay. So yeah. So these people, you know, were religious people. They did many wonderful things for, for society. Right? Uh, how would you describe their faith? Oh, I'm sure they were very faithful. Right? What does Jesus say about them, though? The point is, he called them evil people because they were not doing God's will. Just because the religious world tells you that this is how you're supposed to do it, and this is how you're supposed to become a Christian, and this is, you know, whatever, doesn't mean it's true. And we cannot take for granted those things and just accept whatever they say. Because what if they are wrong? And in the judgment day, you find out Oh, sayang. Diba? Sayang. I could have done something about that. But I didn't know because I didn't think to check. <clears throat> Bible study is important because it is our only way to know what exactly God wants us to do. Diba? So, with this, we're going to begin our uh, our look into the book of Philippians. And we're going to, we're going to try and see, our main goal is to try and see what is it exactly, what are the things that, that Paul, God through Paul, um, is trying to tell these people in Philippi. We're going to look at who the Philippians are. We're going to look at who the writer was. In fact, we'll actually find that there are two mentioned as their writers. Paul and Timothy are, are writing. But we'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. But for now, uh, we're going to take about a 10-15 minute break. We're going to get you guys some snacks. So what we'll ask everybody to do is just to remain seated, and we'll bring the snacks to you.